Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first fully online version of Investor's Guide to Thriving. For the past 10 years, Larry, myself, and our team have looked forward to visiting so much of our beautiful country and meeting all of you, Larry's viewers, and our fellow investors at our live event series. You know, quite frankly, until just a few weeks ago, we had a very different presentation planned. But I think we've all been astounded by how quickly things have changed. We decided instead to focus on supporting investors through these challenging times in markets and in the economy. To that end, this is the first of an ongoing series of webinars, every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern, and on four Saturdays through to the end of April. Each week will be a little different as Larry will take you through how he sees the situation changing, bringing together all the great work he does, digesting the news and analyzing the market response. Many participants ask if they can get Larry's slides. Indeed, you can. Tomorrow at about 10 a.m. Eastern, you'll get an email with a link to complete a short survey to tell us how we did. If you complete the survey, you'll get a link to download all the slides Larry will present here today. You'll also be able to replay the webinar and submit questions for next time. Just remember folks, we don't have a crystal ball and we don't claim to know exactly how this will all play out. So for those of you who are investing at home, and we know that's about 80% of you, be sure to practice prudent diversification and risk management. If you need a little help navigating markets and financial life in general, I'll give you a brief introduction to our group of companies. ETF Capital Management is the portfolio management firm Larry and I started all the way back in 2006. We're now celebrating our second bear market, or maybe we're in a bull market because apparently we're 20% off the lows now. I guess the world is fixed. That's the thing about webinars, no one laughs at your jokes. As I was saying though, ETF Capital Management manages portfolios for several BMO ETFs and funds of ETFs, which are available to all investors. Our team also helps families with portfolios of 1 million and up with comprehensive wealth management. Quintessence Wealth is our platform for independent portfolio managers, and UPotential is a fee-only financial planning firm for those who are only seeking planning. Golden Girl Finance is our financial media site for women, which is also secretly read by men. We have the web stats to prove it. As always, Investor's Guide to Thriving comes to you free of charge in support of two charities that are very dear to Larry and I, Sick Kids and the Baycrest Foundation. When the coronavirus hit and we first activated our pandemic plan at ETF Capital Management, we were already way ahead of the game thanks to Sick Kids. In 2016, my daughter Serena, who was two years old at the time, was diagnosed with leukemia. Among so much else we had to learn about caring for a child with cancer, we also had to contend with her immune system being totally shut down at times from the chemotherapy. We learned all about how to keep her safe from viruses and bacteria. To be honest, it's 80% washing your hands. But I also remember all those times she was stuck inside the house and not even able to go to the park to play. It was hard on the soul, as I know the social isolation we're all going through right now is difficult for all of you. Thank you so much for being with us here today. We hope that you can join Larry and I in supporting leukemia treatments at SickKids and the groundbreaking work being done at the Baycrest Foundation into the treatment of Alzheimer's and dementia. For those of you who have made donations, thank you so much. For those who would like to make donations, please use the, use the links in the survey you'll receive after the event. Thank you also to our sponsors, National Bank Direct Brokerage and BMO Exchange Traded Funds. BMO ETFs has been our partner in ETF education since Investor's Guide to Thriving began 10 years ago. We value their straightforward approach to transparency and fantastic online education resources to help investors make better decisions with ETFs. Here to help you make better decisions with investments with ETFs is our good friend, Mr. Kevin Prince from BMO ETFs. Thank you for that, Jared. And actually, I enjoyed laughing at your jokes. So uh, you didn't hear it, but I actually did do that. You know, I won't take up too much time here, but I really wanted to give everybody, you know, some simple best practices for accessing the marketplace right now. And thanks, Jared, for you know, jumping to that slide. Because, you know, in these markets, we're certainly seeing the movement fast. And we've been talking the time we we're on the road. We've done the, as Jared said, been doing these presentations well, but when we're on the road, we like to talk about these practices and let's just repeat them one more time. When you're looking at the markets, one thing a quick best practice for you is maybe avoid trading the first 15 minutes of the day. I say 10 minutes here, 
But you know, avoid that first 15 minutes, especially around an ETF, because it takes a little while for the price discovery, the underlying to come through, and then the price to be supported in the marketplace and the basket itself. And I'll say the same thing for the end of the day too. You know, maybe shut off your trading before the end of the day. Don't wait till those last 15 minutes to trade because those last 15 minutes, those first 15 minutes, they're very volatile at times. And just a good best practice to maybe not trade in those particular periods of time. Now, I would, another nice tip I'd like to highlight for everybody out there is when you're looking at trading out there, always use limit orders. I know you might see the price up there you want, and that I, you know when you see the spread, the whole works. I get it, but ultimately, what the best thing for you to do is put a limit in order. That's what you want to pay, or that's what you want to sell it. Put that number in there and lock it in. You can always update it, but that just protects you from a fast-moving market and a market that moves in the wrong direction for you. So always use limit orders. A couple, two more tips for you too. Let me highlight, uh, you know. Think about also to trade in markets when they're open if you can. So for example, you know, a European market will basically be closing around the uh, 11 o'clock time period. So you wanna be doing the trades in that period of time before that if you can. And of course, respect the holidays too, because sometimes our market will be open and other markets won't be open. So keep all that in mind when you're trading. Some markets is not possible, for example, Asia, but in market where you can try to trade in the same hours as the marketplace because then the especially with ETFs the offsetting risk can be traded in those respective markets so nice big tip and then my, my last tip or the best practice for everybody in, the, uh, in this session here is think about the volatility itself now in times like this you will see spreads widen and spreads are between the is the is a space between the bid and the offer in which you're trading at and you think that in there, but it's going to change very quickly. Keep that in mind. You always use those limit orders. There's going to be probably a little wider spreads in these markets. That's a natural aspect of risk on and risk off. But put those limit orders to protect yourself in those marketplaces for the awareness of the volatility. And then, you know, I know we've all been going through some, some challenges right now. I mean, certainly no fun to watch the screens on a regular basis. But what I wanted to give you here is it's just a snapshot of the TMX for a period of time. And what we did here was we overlaid a lot of the previous crises that certainly happened. And I know we're in one right now and it's never funny in the middle of them. But if we look back at the respective crises that we've been through, we have got through them. And this is just a good little snapshot of some of the more crises. We're certainly starting off with the Black uh, Monday crisis back in 87. And then we cascade through to some more of the more known ones, of course, and the subprime one uh, back a little more than 10 years ago, 2008. And maybe a more recent one where don't forget uh, back in uh, December 2019, we had a good sell off there too. So there have been a number of crises going along before. It's always good to think about getting through those and how we have got through those. And hopefully we'll get through this one too. Um, and that's more for Larry to talk about than me. The other thing I'll quickly highlight on that slide too is not only do you see the movement of the TMX, but you also see the movement of the fixed income marketplace too, GICs. So you gotta think about that in inflation too as you're looking at when you're investing long-term. Last thing I want to quickly highlight for everybody, highlight for everybody, if you're looking for news and information on the ETF marketplace itself, I encourage you to take a look at our ETF dashboard, demoetfs.ca. On that website, you'll find news and current information on the overall ETF market, a good support for anybody right now in these markets. And from that, I'm going to hand over to Larry. I'm going to do one quick introduction for Larry. I've known Larry actually for hmm, since the start of the, before the millennium. And I remember Larry back in 2001, actually coaching advisors and building courses at CSI. And then back in 2008, working with institutions and working them through those challenges. And now, of course, the last 10 years, working with end investors too in this online series we've been supporting. But certainly now in these webinars, more challenging than ever, it's very good to be a sponsor of this event. And so thank you for hosting this event, Larry and team. I'm going to you, Larry. Cheers. Thanks very much, uh, Kevin, and I'm going to try to uh, get through this as quick as I can and leave as much time for questions as possible because I know everybody's dying to ask them. I see a lot of them rolling in. I, will, I can't get to everyone, guys, but I will try to speak to as many things as I possibly can. Uh, what's keeping me up at night, folks? The, the first chart here, um, and one of the reasons I've been so concerned about markets, and, I, and I've said in public presentations on BNN, um, 
in my almost 35 years in the investment industry, I've never been more concerned about markets in, in my um, career. Um, and it, this chart uh, highlights it. So this is from the Federal Reserve database, and you can see the uh, website there in the corner. But what it shows is that after tax corporate profits, when you adjust for capital cost allowance and inventory adjustments, we've had no growth um, for seven years now. And yet the markets have gone up and up. And, and it's an expansion of the market multiple. And in a large case, uh, it's been pro forma earnings, which I call BS earnings, uh, and, and not, not generally accepted accounting principles, and financial engineering, share buybacks. So that's really been behind a lot of the boost in, in financial markets. And um, it, it hasn't been real. It hasn't been fundamental. And that's one of the big concerns because the market multiple just got so crazy high last year. Now, I didn't forecast. I was worried about China and trade wars and debt and everything else. And all those things now are catalysts uh, for the markets to have a bad experience for the next number of quarters. And as the bear market ultimately plays out, COVID-19 just happened to be this time around the black swan or catalyst. Normally, the bear markets uh, start uh, with the Fed tightening policy. And we saw that a bit in 2018, where the Fed started to raise rates. We had a stroke uh, in markets in the fourth quarter of 2018. The Fed starts easing again, printing money, and the markets revive. This time around, I'm not sure you're going to have that same kind of response. So I wanted to talk a little bit about risk and volatility. And to me, it's very, very simple. When, when the risk factors are high, when markets are expensive, you know, we saw this tremendous fear of missing out, rip your face off rally in, in the last three or four months of, of last year and into this year. And, and to me, it was absolutely ludicrous and insane. Uh, but periods of market volatility, um, happen, um, and, and, the standard deviation of the volatility of markets are, are normally well behaved. You know, 19 times out of 20, 95 percent are within a couple standard deviations. And and I wanted to to talk a little bit about what sleep at night means to me in the portfolios that that I manage. But if you find yourself in an emotional state with this level of volatility, folks, you have the wrong portfolio. You can't handle the risk. When the markets are going up, everybody's good. Everyone wants it. They want more. They want more. But when we go through these periods, and, and they're infrequent, they, but they happen every once in a while, and you, you have to know how to deal with them. So if you're finding yourself emotionally stressed about this market, your, your portfolios are not right for, for the type of investor, ultimately, that you are. So I talk about sleep at night portfolios, and in the context of, of distribution of returns, and fat tails, I use the ETF VT. VT as an ETF represents basically every stock in the world. Vanguard, total world, all country, all capitalization, like it's everything. And the daily standard deviation, the VIX of the world index, 0 0.83. And what that implies, folks, is a VIX reading of 15, 1, 5. And I'll talk more about volatility through the presentation. The standard deviation of the ZZZD in the six and a half years we've been running it now, um, it's only been out in ETF format for a little over a year now, um, is, is of almost half of that. And you can see the distribution of returns and the tails aren't fatter, which means we don't have as extreme moves in the portfolio because when things are rosy and everybody is excited, that's when I take less risk. That's when I batten down the hatches a little bit so that when we go through periods like this and things get cheap, we can get on board. The thing that was interesting about this move compared to every other correction we've had uh, in the last 50 years is this is the fastest move ever in financial markets where we've lost 30% ever, including the Great Depression period. So, so this is very unusual. The hit to the world, the economic hit to the world that's just beginning, folks, is, is in the first inning. And we've got quarters of this to go before we 
see this volatility suppress. And, and again, I'll sleep. Uh, I'll I'll speak to that a little bit. So every week I, I do a report that goes out through the BMO channels. And if you're working with financial advisors, you can get access to it. We we do post the report um, on our zzzportfolios.com website. Sleep at night portfolios. You can Google search that and check it. So this is last weekend's report. And the, the volatility is less. So this is where we've done. So we, we've had standard deviation in the portfolio significantly less than the benchmark. And uh, this chart here, I take in the, the benchmark, which is 80% of the iShares Global Monthly Dividend CAD Hedge ETF. So that ETF searches around the world for the best dividend payers, TYH, and it has a currency hedge. So you don't have to worry about the volatility of the Canadian dollar. Uh, versus all these foreign currencies. And 20%, the BMO high quality, uh, high dividend paying ETF in Canada. And you can see, since we started the fund in 2013, this correction has wiped out almost 100% uh, of the return of, those, of the benchmark. So you can see the benchmark sitting there at about half of 1% return annualized, where we're up at four, four and a quarter, four and a half, and you can see some of the various other ETFs. VT, there's the Vanguard Total World ETF. And so you can see we've delivered better than average returns with less risk. And so that's what Sleep at Night is. I've got a lot of criticism on uh, Twitter and, and through emails. Some people get mad. They go, oh, Larry, you, you run these Sleep at Night portfolios. It's down so much. Well, listen, gold didn't protect us, so I didn't know that, right? So I had a lot of gold exposure. But in the last week, gold's come back, and so has the fund. I, I, put, I, I have exposure in emerging market, local currency debt. I love it. It's yielding 7% now. But because of the flights of safety um, into U.S. dollars, some of those emerging currencies have, have seen some weakness, and we've seen some spread come back. But it's great. It's yielding 7%. In fact, what I'm going to do with EMLC in the portfolio when we get to the levels, and I'll talk about that, uh, is flip that bond into emerging market equities. So I'm earning 7%. There's some volatility with it, not worried about it. And when equities get attractive relative to bonds, I'm going to sell my bonds and buy my equities. And boy, will those rip higher when, when things recover. That's still months and months away. So, so folks, that's what sleep at night is, is managing risk and trying to deliver over the long term, not over every day and week, but over the long term, a better experience so that you don't have the anxiety or as much of it uh, as things go along. So uh, I love it for that. I talk about sleep at night and, and we are sleep at night managers. So let's talk about the 2008 and 9 playbook because folks, I've talked about this the last couple of weeks on the special editions of Berman's Call that we've moved to Thursday. The reason we've done this temporarily is because Trudeau has picked the 11 to 12 time slot to do his conference calls uh, or his talks to the nation, which is very, very important so that he communicates with all of us. So great, but it was going to bump Berman's Call every week. So because of that, we've taken the Thursday and we're doing a special one hour edition and you know, after this is all over, we'll, we'll go back to our Monday regular time slot, I'm quite sure. So normally buy the dip. And what buy the dip is, when I talk about VIX, understand that a VIX level of 10 is a daily standard deviation of 0.63%. So in a couple slides ago, when I showed you that the daily volatility of the world index is 0.83, that, that's about a 14, 15 VIX. That, that's normal long-term average. Below that, you're getting complacent, and above that, you're, you're, you've got opportunity with volatility. Now, a VIX of 80, the recent peaks that we've seen and the spikes that we saw back in the post-Lehman world, um, so the blue line here, folks, is the VIX index, and, and the, the green and red is the candlestick chart of the S&P 500 in the period you know, following. So, so it's the middle of September 15th. That's when Lehman went bankrupt, and that's really in 2008 and 9 what started the financial storm and the contagion uh, with debt and credit uh, in the U.S. housing sector. So to calculate what that expectation of volatility is on a daily basis, you take the VIX number and you divide it by the square root of 252 trading days in a year. 
And so a VIX of 80 is a 5% daily range. A VIX of 60, which is where we closed today, is a 3.75% daily range. And a VIX of 40 is a 2.5% daily range. Weekly, a VIX of 80, 11% swings in a week. So what you're going to experience until VIX normalizes, and the bottom is not going to be in for equities at a minimum until VIX normalizes. And what normal is, is something closer to 20. But at a very minimum, we've got to get past this peak volatility period. And as you can see, in 2008 and 9, even as the peak in volatility occurred in the months after Lehman went under and TELF and TARF and, and all these programs kicked in. We still had tremendous volatility. We had lift your face off rallies. Look at the rally in October uh, from, from when TARF was passed uh, and to the bounce. So the S&P 500 went from a low of about 870 and it bounced to a little over 1,000 before falling back to 870, bouncing to a lower high and then selling off again to a lower low in November, followed by a month and a half of a strong rally back and ultimately bottoming out to a new low into 2009. And if you don't think that's going to happen after this, if you think this is the biggest shock to the world is a V-shaped recovery and we're okay, uh, you're naive, folks. So when it gets to, to the high volatility periods, you're going to make all kinds of emotional mistakes. All the questions coming in, what should I buy today? I want to buy, I want to buy, I got cash, I want to buy. Folks, we're not there yet. VIX needs to normalize, okay? So very, very, very important. Now, here's something that I really like, and, and what, what CNN does in their fear and greed index. And what we had seen uh, earlier, late last year and earlier this year, was, was the fear gauge over 90. And when it gets over 90, you've you, you got to take less risk, folks. That's not the time to, to be a momentum. That's not the time to buy a stock that's trading at 80 times earnings that barely has any earnings. That's the time to sell those names, say thank you very much, take your profit, and buy the most defensive stocks you can that have the best yields so that you can get your income while you're waiting for the next downturn, whenever that might be. And I don't know when that's going to be. And I say that all the time. We can't time markets. Very, very important to understand. Now, when the, the, the extreme fear gauge is in, now this gauge doesn't ask about sentiment. It doesn't take your opinion, are you scared or not? That's the AAII and the institutional investor surveys. This measures seven factors. It says, what is the level of VIX compared to its 50-day average, is it elevated or not, statistically? What's happening in the option markets? Are people buying more puts than calls on a five-day average basis? What's the market breadth like? What, what's the McClellan oscillator telling us about the number of stocks where volume is going up and going down? What is the difference in returns between stocks and bonds? So what's the average 20-day stock return versus the average 20-day bond return? How many stocks are making new highs versus new lows in the broad New York Stock Exchange? What is the credit market telling us? What is the spread between high yield bonds and high quality corporate bonds? And then how far are we deviating from trend from the mean 125 day average? So based on all those things and what you can see during these periods of extreme volatility most of the time is that for months it stays down at these levels. So make use of the fear and greed index at CNN. It's free on their website. And I'm, I'm hoping to build something like this into my website uh, in the not too distant future, because I think this is an excellent gauge for telling people when they should take less risk and when they take more. And, and I love to use the example of the three demo ETFs that for most investors are completely adequate for, for managing their portfolios. ZCON is a conservative 40% equity, 60% balance portfolio. ZBAL is 60% equities, 40% bonds. And ZGRO is 80% equities and 20% bonds. And when this indicator is at the extreme levels, go to the conservative portfolio. 
And when it's oversold like it is now, that's the time to go to more balance or more growth. That simple. Couple trades a year, back and forth, and do them for free at your discount broker with National Bank. So very, very uh, easy ways to navigate portfolios uh, for those people who don't want to do a lot and just want to keep it very simple. That's the easiest thing to do. Now, where's the bottom of the market, the most asked question I get? And, and what I'm showing here is the blue, the blue dashed line is trailing earnings per share for the S&P 500. The black dotted line is the estimate, the best estimate of all the Wall Street analysts who pick stocks and what their one-year forecast is. So the forecast is always well above the trailing because markets, people look forward and they say earnings are going to grow. At this moment in time, Analysts one year out from today still believe earnings are going to be higher. These guys are so out to lunch and behind the curve, it's not funny. And what we saw in 2008 and 9 is it wasn't until these, these guys, this group of analysts on Wall Street, the black dotted line, got to the same level as trailing earnings. In other words, they started to say, okay, on a forward basis, earnings are going to be lower than they are today that the market's actually washed out and bottomed. We haven't seen that yet. It hasn't even started yet. We're in the first inning of this, folks. So if 2008 and 9 is even a remote guideline of the market risk ahead of us, and back then in 2007 where we started the bear market, the multiple was 17 times earnings. This market multiple started at 22 times earnings. And so from a, an earnings perspective, the market bottomed at 666 on the S&P 500, 500 with forward earnings estimated to be $60. So you can see on the left axis is earnings per share and on the right axis is the level of the S&P 500. So far, folks, we've just taken off the froth. And at the bottom of bear markets, multiples are low. So what is what, what are the fundamentals telling us? So here's a snapshot from Bloomberg, which takes all the forward 12-month analyst estimates. And as of a couple of days ago, when the S&P was at 23.04, the, the EPS, the multiple was 15. In the long run, 15.16 is a fair multiple. But that's based on trailing earnings. What are earnings going to be over the next year? And, and the analysts on Wall Street think they're going up for the next few years. They're out to lunch crazy. It's not going to happen in this world. So what should it be? And because they're going to ban share buybacks in a big way, and because the C-suite is going to be under a microscope, every company and the airlines are the worst that have been abusing the share buybacks and raising money and adding leverage and making their balance sheets really, really crappy so that they need the help in times like what they should have been doing is paying down debt, being very conservative, because we're at the end of the business cycle. We didn't know it was gonna be COVID-19, but if you're a prudent officer, you do that. If you're an officer of a, of a company that wants to line their pockets with share options, you take, you borrow money at cheap rates, you buy back shares, you don't care what the balance sheet looks like, because the Fed's gonna be there to save us. And they're there again, buying in mass. So we're not going back to a 20 times multiple. At best, we're going back to a 16 or 18 multiple. So what are earnings going to be? Because at 150, right, 152.03 trailing earnings in the bank, 10% of those have been because of share buybacks. Another 10% is pro forma BS nonsense. In other words, they take share buybacks. So, so, so stock-based compensation, not included. Uh, One-time item, not included. So the real gap earnings, they're about $120. And so the multiple then at the peak was more like 30 times. Okay, so even if earnings don't collapse, and we only go back to 120 in earnings, 16 multiple on 120 earnings tells you the S&P 500 fair value, minimum downside target for me to start bringing out my shopping list is 1920. And we are going to see that almost certainly. 
But if earnings collapse 50%, like they did in 2008 and 9, which is almost certain, $75 or from 120 to $60 with an average of 68. 68 times 16 gives you 1,088 on the S&P. And God forbid we go to 11 multiple on that, we're testing the lows from 2009, 748. Technically, there's lots of levels we can lean on for support. The 50% retracement is the next one on the downside here, 2030 of the entire bull market. That's a reasonable target for us to test on the next leg down here. And then beyond that, the two-thirds retracement, the 61.8%, 1508. I like the area of the old highs from 2000 and 2007, 1550, 1575. So there's all kinds of technical targets. Nobody on the planet can tell you what the right level is and where it's going to bottom. These are all the things I'm looking for. But folks, my shopping list doesn't come out until we're below 2000. And there, uh, I will start to, to add things to the portfolio. So what should we do in the meantime to help grow and protect? So when the risk factors are high, one of the things I did in the sleep at night portfolios is I added these two ETFs, VTAL and QBTL. I don't own them today. I covered these because they made me good money in the last couple of months when the S&P was at about 2300 a few days ago. So a market neutral portfolio that's long 200 really good low volatility stocks. BMO has a lot of good low vol ETFs. And it's short 200 of the high risk, high beta uh, stocks. So it's market neutral, long and short, but it has a negative risk factor because the beta, the, the, the higher beta versus lower beta, gives you a negative skew. And so when the markets sell off, so on the top line, I'm showing you the value line geometric index. What that index is, is the average price of the average stock every day. And you can basically see, going back to 2013, that today the average stock hasn't gone up since 2013. And that is, folks, right in line with what the average U.S. company is reporting in after-tax earnings. Folks, the entire lift in the last number of years is all smoke and mirrors on fundamentals. It's expansion because money is easy. And the solution is more easy money. <laughs> so it, it, it's going to be very, very interesting, uh, certainly in the next couple of years, folks. Another uh, way to play this, and one of my favorite ETFs for the next couple of years is, is V-Style, ZPay. So a couple of years ago, I was telling people I liked the put right ETF, um, ZPW, uh, and it, it, it didn't do what I hoped it would do. And I asked BMO to create another one, and uh, Purpose ETFs has had one out for a few years already. Uh, but the BMO version is ZPay and PYF for that. And then, and, and then I, so I'm showing you on the chart here what a high dividend covered call would do, ZWH, compared to the broad U.S. market compared to these two ETFs. Um, but ZPay has only been out for a few months, so I'm using the Purpose ETF. So the Purpose ETF is the, the Steady Eddy, that, that white line, and, and it's writing puts to generate income. It's doing covered call strategies. It's designed to, to get about 5 or 6% yield and to take less risk, but it's not risk-free. Every time the market corrects, it goes down, and to the degree of the correction, it goes down less. So you can see what it did on this last collapse here, it went down. And you can see what ZWH did, it went down. Compared to the entire stock market that went down way more, but went way up. So when you're bullish and the risk factors are low and the CNN fear and greed index is at a low level, you want exposure to the broad markets. You don't want covered calls, you don't want options, you want that the market, VTI, Vanguard total U.S. market ETF. And you can buy the S&P 500 and all the ETF providers have versions of those, et cetera. But when you want to pray for tech, this is going to get out of the market and get into the one that gives you a yield and it's going to give you less volatility, more sleep at night. So, but once you have the average correction, if there's no recession coming, that average correction is going to be around 13.5%. 
When there's a correction coming, it's going to be at around 29%. And, and in this case, it's probably going to be a 50% haircut from the top, at least. Um, so those are a couple of ETFs. Here's another interesting one. It's a long, short pairs trade ETF put out by Desjardins, D-A-N-C, trades in Toronto. So they're long the bank they like and they're short the bank they don't like. And they're long the utility they like and they're short the utility they don't like. And they're long the oil company they like and they short the oil company and so forth. And they, they line up all these pairs, about 50 of them. And so it's market neutral and it's designed to, to be money market like. It's not money market risk, but it's market neutral. And so again, when you want something in your portfolio that acts like cash, but gives you a little bit more than cash, because I'm comparing this to a money market ETF in the US, SHV, uh, which is the orange line, you can see you do a little bit better with, with a smart portfolio manager making bets on good stocks and bad stocks. So you want more of that in your portfolio when you want to be in a risk off to still generate potential for return and yield. Okay, So there's lots of things you can do in your portfolios, folks. When you want to be risk off, you don't have to go to cash and cash pays nothing although cash is, is good too sometimes. Here are these other type of ETFs that are called from the Innovator ETF series and Evolve ETF in Canada, I think, maybe it's not Evolve. There's an ETF provider in Canada that has just come out with these a uh, couple months ago. But I introduced these on Berman's call a year ago when they first came out into the marketplace. And what I want to show you is an example of these three buffer ETFs and how they work and what they do. So these allow you, and I've been doing this for clients in my uh, high net worth client portfolios that we do custom portfolios for people for, for several years now. And these are a great way to, when you're nervous, to still participate in some market upside but to minimize downside. So they have what's called a buffer, which gives you a 9% hedge on your portfolio. They have a power buffer, which they call a 15% hedge on your portfolio, and the ultra buffer which gives you uh, the first 5% is at risk, but protects the next 25%, so from 5 to 30%. And it allows you at the same time that you're protecting some of the downside to capture anywhere from 8 to 11% of the upside. And so go to the, this ETF provider website, Innovator ETFs. And again, there's one in Canada here, and I can't remember the name, but you can Google search it and find it. And you can see the difference in the different behaviors as we go through the corrections. And so if you were nervous a year ago, you could have bought one of these and you can see that depending on which one you bought, you got a lot of upside in the market. So the red line is the S&P 500. And so with that, you have the most risk. You get all the upside, you get all the downside. That's the most volatile. But then once you get by one of these buffer ones, so you can see the white line, gave you some upside. You, you got, you, as the markets went up, you, you were up about 12, 13% at the peak there. And then the downside comes in, but you can see it goes down less than the market. Doesn't eliminate the downside, but it goes down less. That was the 9% buffer. The ones that protect more don't give you as much upside. So you can see those were capped around 7, 8% in February. Again, going from the last, these are the April version. Every month they come out with a new version of these. Know your product, read the literature on this. They have a lot of videos you can watch on these. You can see how little they fell. So they were up, they fell, and they're now down as of a couple of days ago, they were down around seven or 8% or in that range. So there are tools to have alternative types of holdings in your portfolio that you can have during these risk adverse periods. And so I would highly recommend that when the fear index is at maximum greed, that you look at some of these alternatives, you consider the sleep at night portfolios, or you do something to reduce your risk. You don't tell me on Twitter that I'm an idiot and that you're all in because those, yeah, you could still make money, but, but you know, those aren't the times to be making bets. It's the time to be conservative. And folks, as active as I am, as tactical as we are in our portfolios, I am one of the most conservative portfolio managers in Canada, by far, because I care about the risk of your portfolio before I say, wow. But when the value is good, when that multiple is 10, 11, 12, 
Folks, that's the time to back up the truck. That's the time to bring out your shopping list. So let's talk a little bit about the shopping list because I see the world and all the debt that's been created as, as very, very troubling. And while the central banks will be there and they'll print money, I think that's very compelling to keep interest rates low. So you want to buy backups. And when bonds sell off, you want to buy them. Long duration treasuries I've talked about for a number of years as being very, very good to have in your portfolios. A couple examples there, ZTL and, and TLT. And gold. I love gold. I think gold's going to retest the old highs and probably go higher. In every scenario, folks, that I run on how the world plays out for the next one, three, and five years, there's not a scenario that doesn't include um, the, the Fed um, uh, basically printing money to monetize debt. And in that world, uh, gold is going to do very, very well. Now, when we come out of this, what I'm showing on the graphic here is the natural rate of growth in economies around the world. And the lighter green it is compared to the darker blue and purplish, the lighter green are going to have less growth because of demographic problems, debt problems, um, aging societies, and, and so forth. So you can see the developed world, North America and largely most of Europe, has a natural growth rate that's really low. And they've been growing largely in the last decade because of all the debt. And while there will be more of that, the natural growth rate in most of the world is going to come down to the 1% to 2% range. But in the parts of the world that are young, where the average worker, like in Italy, the average person is 48 years old. Japan is 49. Germany is 46. China is 42. North America is 40. Compared to the sub-Saharan Africa, where the average woman is 20 years old, having lots of kids in India, where the average person is 22. So, so the potential growth rate, there's two things that are going to service in a big way growth of the developing world in the years to come. Technology, technology, technology. But, but China's building this Silk Road initiative. And one of the battles going on between the Trump administration and, and, and the Xi administration and will be beyond Trump and beyond Xi, although he's there until 2035 at least, is going to be the battle for the supremacy and leadership in the world. Uh, I'm reading a very good book on, on that now, and, and I can't think of the name off the top of my head that I just finished. But it's, it's about the war. Of, of all the wars in the world that are being fought. And, and the most prolific war that's being fought other than COVID-19 is the war between China and U.S. supremacy. Uh, think about going back 100 years ago where Great Britain led the world 200 years ago. And North America was the birth of North America, the U.S. Civil War, the breakaway of the Americas from the, the control of, of the uh, kingdom and that part and how U.S. became the leader in the world. China wants to be the leader in the world. They have 1.3 billion people. The this battle is going to be deep. And their Silk Road initiative for the next five years is going to help countries that in many cases are very young, like Thailand and Vietnam. South Korea is not a young country. They're 42 on average. But they've got a, a backbone, and they don't have the same fiscal problems that Japan has, but the new Japan. So EWI is South Korea, Vietnam, Thailand, broad emerging markets. What I'm going to do with my EMLC ETF that I'm building a position, which is great, a great yielder at 7% right now, and I'm glad, you know, getting paid. Um, but I'm building exposure in emerging market currencies. And when this period of U.S. dollar safe haven is over, as this thing come, rolls out over the next year or two, and the U.S. dollar comes back to Earth, we're going to gain a lot of money in these emerging market currencies. I'm going to swap the debt into the equity uh, somewhere below 2000 on the S&P and rise with the world as things recover over the next few years. In a low growth world where you want to buy low and sell high, ZPAY that writes puts on great company and when things sell off, they buy great companies at lower prices. They generate 5 to 6% yield. When they own those companies, they write calls on them to sell them at the levels they want to sell them to generate extra yield from those. 
that's going to be an ETF that thrives for the dividend payers with a lot less volatility overall than the broader markets. And in a low growth world, something like that is going to be core in my dividend seeking portfolios. Folks, you want to avoid all the companies that have gone to the trough and been big pigs on buybacks. And the airlines, while they're going to be tradable and volatile, are going to be put in the penalty box. Listen, airlines are essential. They are effectively, in my view of the world, a utility. We need them. I think they're going to be regulated coming out of this. So we'll see how that all plays out. And there are some of the worst culprits in the SPYB ETF. And this is an ETF that the S&P large cap buybackers, these are all the companies that have spent billions on buybacks. Now, Apple's in that bucket, but Apple's got billions of cash, and they're not going to need the government's help here. So Apple's a standout, and so is Microsoft. But all the ones other than that that have been buying back shares and at the expense of a crappy balance sheet are going to be punished by Congress in a big way. But when I think about my kids and eventually when my kids have kids and and what I want to put in their school accounts to pay over the next 20 years for their university educations, it's cybersecurity. It's the Internet of Things. It's, it's, it's everything to do with the next group wave of technology that's going to be disruptive. And here's a basket of ETFs and robotics and artificial intelligence, clean energy. Folks, clean energy is the future. Uh, oil stocks are going to bounce back and oil prices are going to go back to 40 or $50, but they're going to stay there. That industry is dying slowly. It's going to take 50 years to completely die out. But the world is serious about climate change. And clean energy, these stocks are getting cheap, um, and, and I really like ICLN in that regard. Uh, but EMQQ, this is emerging market NASDAQ. So this is technology servicing emerging markets and a lot of ADRs in there, and you'll know a lot of the names. So these are amongst the names. I'm not buying any of them. I haven't bought any of them yet. I'm not buying any of them. These come out. When we get below 2,000 on the S&P, I start going shopping, and I leg in. I buy a quarter, I buy a quarter, I buy a quarter. Every notch down, I keep buying and adding. And when we ultimately bottom out, wherever that is in that range that I talked about, that's where we, we want to get to um, in, in, the, uh, in the portfolios uh, as we come out of this. So we, we have uh, now some time for questions. And so a lot of people wrote in, um, so I'm going to get to those first, and I'll take as many of, of, of them as we possibly uh, can um, that people have, uh, have written in already. So, so here we go. So Megan writes, I'm thinking of selling uh, off today and waiting in cash if the markets are going to drop further. So I have no problem with that. But, but Megan, so when, when I'm running ZZZD and I have a promise to the world to get 35 or 4% yield, I, I can't go to cash because if I'm wrong and the markets go up and I'm sitting in cash and not generating yield, so I can't do that. What individuals do in their own portfolios, they only have to be responsible to themselves. So you're not going to find most portfolio managers are going to do anything about it. But for me in ZZZD, I put the portfolio, I've got a lot of dead pay and I've got some, I've got some cash. I've got some gold. I've got some emerging market bonds. I'm still generating the yield that I promised to generate for people, providing all the companies don't cut their dividends in half, but uh, I'm generating those yields, but I'm doing it with significantly less risk. So do you want that ride, Megan, or do you want the ride of, of, of being all out and all in and trying to time the market? And, and, and as someone who specializes in timing markets and making risk decisions every day, and I've been doing this for pretty much every day of my 35 years in the investment industry, making decisions on risk and return uh, as an analyst and as a portfolio manager. It's the hardest thing to do to time markets. And what the hardest part of that is the emotional ride. Because if you sell today, Megan, and this rip your face off rally goes another three or 400 points higher in the S&P, which it can easily, then you're going to, oh, and you're going to chase it and you're going to buy in higher and then it's going to sell off. So are you equipped to do that? Now, I don't think that's going to happen, but it might. But ultimately, I think we're going to lower lows. So thanks for that question, Megan. Um, There's nothing wrong with that if you have the toolbox 
uh, to do it. How do I balance my portfolio when most of my stocks are down 20, 30%? How do I pick the ones to get rid of? And hopefully, eventually, I can get back in at better levels when the market stabilizes, Amy. Very tough call, Amy. Um, and what I'm saying is if you're in a taxable account, so a lot of people don't like to sell things in a taxable account because they don't want to pay tax. And so that's fine. So you can't have risk mitigation in your portfolios unless you know how to use options. So if you're in a taxable account and you're in a margin account and the fear index, Amy, is, is at 90 plus, what I would do if I were doing that, and I do that in my, not in the BMO funds, but I do that in my high net worth client portfolios, I go out and load up on, on good yielding ETFs that I want to generate that yield because people need that. And then I buy a put and I use an option strategy to hedge. And I can write a put and I can write a call and we can do a call and there's all kinds of option strategies. And, and two times ago in our Across Canada Road Tour, we talked about a lot of those. There's some of the things we do and can do. So, so there are tools to use. You just got to know the toolbox. That's why I spend so much time, Amy, on investor education on Berman's Call. And if you're, a, if you're a watcher, which I imagine you are, try to tune in and go back and look at some of those because we, we take all these issues up and we try to educate people as much as possible. It's very hard to do once you're down 20 or 30%, but in a taxable account, I would look for taking gains where you still have them and offset them with losses like a pair trade. And so there's no tax hit and then raise cash with that, that, those two together. And I would look at doing some of that to raise some cash to hopefully buy back some things cheaper. But for the great companies that you own, like Apple, that you're not worried too much about, don't worry about it. Don't try to trade it. Understand that you want to own that for the next 10 or 20 years, and don't worry about the volatility. But if the emotional ride is a big problem, then you've got to learn some of these other techniques to mitigate. Um, so how do you rebalance that? It's, it's not easy. In an in account where it's not taxable, Again, I, I would recommend from time to time that you take some money off the table because there's no tax implication and use some of the alternative ETFs. Down 20 or 30%, I, I wouldn't be doing that. It's not the right time. I, I, what I would be doing is looking to sell stuff that didn't go down as much and buy some of the great companies or ETFs that you might want to own coming out of this. And, and so sell, sell one that's at a 10% loss to buy one that you want to own for the next five or 10 years that's at a 50% loss and make that trade. So hopefully you can do some of that, Amy. Sylvia, what's the best way to buy gold as an independent investor? For me, Sylvia, it's the ETF. So I, I highlighted a couple of them. Uh, GLD is the one that I use mostly that trades in the US as gold bullion. There's a number of different providers. They all have their own stories on why they're the best. For me, I want the deepest liquidity pool, so trading is never an issue, and that's GLD. So I like that one, and there's the one in Canada where you can buy gold with a currency hedge, um, and that's CGL. Uh, so those are the two that I would use, um, but for trading purposes, for the size that I do in my portfolio, Sylvia, I need liquidity, so I use GLD. I can hedge the currency risk with forward that, that the average person can't do. So I don't worry too much about the currency for me. It's okay. If people want to go out and buy gold bars and certificates and all that stuff, you know, good luck with that. But uh, for, for trading and investing purposes, the ETFs are more than adequate. Peter in Ottawa, do you think that restaurant brands are a good long-term investment to buy? I, I don't love private equity and 3G. And, and I know I have a friend, good friend who, who owns a handful of, of Tim Horton stores and, and they're not happy with the management uh, at this point. That doesn't mean that people aren't going to go back to Tim Horton's when this is all over. And a depression in a good stock like Tim Horton's and a restaurant brands or other food stocks aren't going to come back. They, they most certainly will. Um, so I have no issue with it. I think it's, it's a fine brand. Um, they're having trouble with uh, growing sales. Uh, they're having trouble in Tim Hortons with new products. Uh, McDonald's is eating their lunch significantly on coffee sales. And it just ask yourself, which coffee do you like better? And a lot of people these days are saying McDonald's and coffee at 50%, something like that of Tim Hortons sales. So 
Um, so just a couple of things to think about. There's, there may be better ones to own, Peter. Rick asked, uh, asset allocation, uh, asset allocation and portfolios, got 10 years to retire, I invest from ETFs. I tend to be conservative like, like Larry is. I added that. I reassess my holdings every three to six months to see what needs to change. I feel I'm not well diversified at the moment. Can you please advise about creating a balanced portfolio? Rick, those three ETFs I mentioned in the BMO lineup, ZCON, ZBAL, ZGRO. That's all everyone really needs who wants to be very generic and diversified around the world. Um, I got a little bit too much exposure in Canada for my liking, but I'm not too too pissed about that, really. I think they're excellent tools for, for balance, uh, navigating balanced portfolios. And I highlight again, when the fear and greed index is at the high levels and greed is, is, is very, very strong, go to the conservative portfolio, rebalance. When we're in an environment like we are on now today, go to balance. And when it gets really ugly, go to growth. And that's all you need to do um, in, in portfolios for people who just look for generic balance. For those approaching midlife who haven't yet started investing, the millennial Chris, um, can you suggest the ETF-based approach where investments could be held for the long term? Would this be a good time to start investing or is there more downside? Well, if you listen to the presentation, millennial Chris, you know that I think more downside is coming. Um, I highlighted what my shopping list is for a young millennial, who understands technology. There's a lot of great things in cybersecurity, uh, the Internet of Things that I, I think, rather than trying to pick which company is going to win, not unlike the dot-com bubble of, of the late 1990s and the, and the boom in technology there, uh, you, you didn't know which one was going to be the winner. But the winner was Amazon, largely, right? Amazon had a 96% drawdown from the peak in 2000 to the bottom a couple of years later. And there's not anybody on the planet can uh, can stand that kind of volatility. Buy the ETF, get your diversification, make sure you're in the right sector and asset class. Very, very important, Millennial Chris. Steve asked, uh, curious Larry, what do you think about longer term government bonds? 5% of direct holdings are in provincial and federal bonds with maturities 10 years out. Thinking of moving this into a corporate bond, um, uh, like short-term bond, like XCB that holds uh, uh, triple Bs. So there's a lot of good yields now as credit spreads have widened out where you've got some banks and insurance companies that in all likelihood are might have some short-term difficulties but are just going to be fine paying their bondholders and I wouldn't worry too much about them. So short-term triple Bs are okay. Where I get concerned is the individual companies that have really crappy balance sheets and I talked about a lot of those in the buyback names uh, in the U.S. in particular. Not as much here in Canada, but in the U.S. So a good corporate uh, ETF like that is interesting. BMO has a new ETF with the ticker ZBBB, I believe, is the ticker. And that gives you an exposure to that triple B basket. Uh, so go have a look at some of the names in there, and that might be interesting for you too, uh, Steve. Uh, ZST, again, is another good holding of short-term corporates that are giving you a, a good quality, higher yield. It's, it's better. It's like a money market ETF that doesn't have a lot of risk in it. So that's pretty good too um, as a, a shift out of longer-term bonds, Steve, if that's what you're, uh, what you're looking for. Oh, Paul, I'm wondering about buying convertible bonds for a portion of my fixed income portfolio, looking at two ETFs, namely iShares and, and First Assets. So, Convertible bond, CWB, is the U.S. convertible bond ETF um, that, that has a 50% correlation to the S&P 500. So convertible bonds and convertible preferreds in that basket are very risky. They have equity-like risk. And while at some point I would certainly say, yeah, go for it, uh, it's, we're not there yet. At the time you want to buy stocks, that might be the time to buy some convertible bonds for your fixed income part of your portfolio, Opal. Mel asks, when's the best time to, to, to sell uh, long bonds? So I, I think if things get really bad, we can get into an environment where uh, they have targeted rates. 
coming out of World War II, the government uh, held interest rates uh, for longer term treasuries at, at 1%. And we might get into a situation if the supply of bonds gets too high. If, for example, China and the US uh, don't get along, and China says, you know what, you can have your bonds back. And they sell $3 trillion worth of treasuries into the open market. That's going to be the environment where the U.S. Treasury steps in and says, listen, every bond up to 1%, we're just going to buy. And it's not unlike what Japan has said, is that the 10-year rate is capped at 10 basis points. So, so we could see that if, if the supply of bonds into the market from all the holders of U.S. Treasuries happen. But I would say, you know, below 1% for long bonds is, is where you want to unload. And, and Mel, that's where I sold my last tranche um, a couple weeks ago. We had about 10% positions in the sleep at night portfolios and long treasuries. And I sold part of it when the, when the 10-year went below 1%. And I sold the last tranche when the 30-year uh, spiked below 1%. And uh, if supply pushes bond yields back, to about one and a quarter to one and a half in the 10 year and 175 to 2% in the 30 year, I'm going to be adding those bonds back. They're great trading vehicles. They give you anti-correlation to equities and I, and I love using them. Okay, next question here comes from Jean-Pierre. When buying specific US stocks on NASDAQ, which uh, with Canadian dollars, how can we build protection against the dollar rising? The answer is you can't. <laughs> If you are in a margin account and you have the ability to use futures contracts, you can forward hedge some futures. Uh, you can use the uh, anti-US uh, dollar ETFs that, that go up when the Canadian dollar uh, goes down or something like that. But really, unless you're using leverage, it's, it's almost impossible to do as an individual investor. Uh, as a portfolio manager, I was very long the US dollar. I sold one tranche of that off around 139, 140, so call it around 71 cents. And then I sold the, the, the remaining tranche off and, and my, most of my portfolios right now are pretty much fully hedged for US dollar exposure. And the last tranche I, I got rid of at about 68 cents, recent, near the recent extreme 68 and a half in that range. And uh, tonight, right now, in fact, if the Canadian dollar jumps above 71 again, I'm gonna start adding back U.S. dollar exposure. But I can do that in the forward markets, and it's very easy to do that. Individual investors really can't play that game unless they're playing with futures and futures options. Jeff asked, based on past recommendations, you hold ZWE and ZDH. Both had covered call strategies. I gather they have produced larger dividends and limited downside, but will not perform well when stocks rebound on that basis. Should I sell them and put money elsewhere? So Jeff, when, when, the, when the magnitude of the decline it was as cute and rapid, covered call strategies offer virtually no protection at all. The markets went down so fast and so rapid, the, the extra premium that you earn over a year doesn't pay off. And when the markets do bounce back, you, as they rewrite those options, you're going to get called away and underperform. So what you want to do then is switch at some point uh, again, target S&P below 2,000, um, and to get out of ZWE and then buy a ZDI, which, which gives you international dividends, so a similar basket of stocks without the covered call. And in the U.S., you would buy ZDY, I think, which, which is, is, is not, so is that, uh, which is not, um, exposed. And, and maybe I'm mixing the tickers up, but you get the idea. When markets are down, you don't want much covered call exposure unless you're, you're okay with that and you just want the extra yield. Um, you want the, the entirety of the market recovery when it bounces back. But if you've listened to the presentation, you know I'm not uh, uh, expecting, other than rapid trading rallies, not much of a long-term recovery in markets here. Do you have any tips on how in a crazy market like this to stick to a plan? Does it even make sense to try to make a plan in this market? Steven, if you're investing and you don't have a plan, bad on you. you. You have to know what you do because if you don't, anxiety takes over. It becomes 
the, the default part of our brain, folks, is it, it goes to the gut feel and goes to the emotion. The cognitive, thoughtful, planning part of our brain gets suppressed when anxiety levels rise, and everybody has this, and we can't control it for the most part. And I have it too, except I know about it, and I know how to deal with it, and I have a game plan, and I have a plan. Stephen, it's never too late to have a plan. I talked about a lot of tools today that can help you navigate this market, but in the post-Lehman world that remains my playbook, you must be selling rallies, and buying into oversold conditions and, and trading if you're into trading. So on the strong days, lighten up. On the heavy sell-off days, you want to buy. It's going to add value as things play out. You want to leg in and leg out, not all in or all out. Leg in, leg out. A quarter, 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 a third, third, a third into positions. Sell them off in chunks. That's how you need to navigate these high volatility periods. Good luck, Stephen. It's, it's it's 35 years of learning, and I still learn things every day. In previous appearances on BNN Bloomberg, I've heard you talk about an approach to investing in gold, starting with gold mining companies and then shifting to gold bullion. I've not picked up on your underlying rationale. Would you elaborate? Sure. So, so great question. The volatility of gold stocks compared to gold bullion is about two to one. So the risk and potential return is about double in the stocks compared to the large cap ones. When you get to the small cap ones, they have even more leverage to the price of underlying gold movements, and they have a two and a half or three times the risk and volatility. They're not leveraged ETFs, but they're leveraged to the price of the underlying commodity because it's the underlying commodity that's the revenue source to the firm. Now, in a, in a very difficult market like we're in now, what we saw in recent weeks is that gold is used as an asset class in relative value funds and in risk parity funds. And it's one of the biggest growth areas in hedge fund styles in the last decade, these risk parity funds. And I talk about a guy named Ray Dalio who founded a firm called Bridgewater, who's the pioneer in this risk parity Area. So they leverage up the portfolio, they allocate your money in all these different asset classes, they generate good returns, and then one day when risk off and you have a shock like we've had, people say, Mr. Dalio, Mr. Smith, Mr. Jones, whoever's running the portfolio, give me my money back. There's an ETF that tracks risk parity strategies. You can go see what's in it. It's uh, uh, RPAR, Trades in New York. Go look at the holdings, go look at the website, see what's in it. So when these things get sold and they have to raise money, they sell, so they sell gold and gold equities because it's an asset class, not a choice. So in the, in the stampede for the exit, the deleveraging process throws currencies into the swing, throws everything all over the place. In that dip, I recognized what was happening and I actually added to my exposure in gold because the baby was getting thrown out with the bathwater for no reason. The fundamental underlying reason why gold should go higher has never been stronger. You don't want to get shaken out with stops in those kind of markets. And the volatility was, these stocks got cut in half. The gold equity stocks, gold bullion only fell 10%. So that's what I mean by the underlying stocks being more volatile. Now, I've heard on BNN in the last number of days, they've had some CEOs and CFOs of gold companies, and they can't work either. So they're going to have some earnings impairments. And, and so that's holding back some of the gold stocks uh, at the moment as well. Lots of things there, Ron. Great question. Thank you. Blake says, in the low-rate environment, investors seeking yield, I'm thinking even with the recent pullback, that REITs are a solid place. Not sure about REITs in the retail or apartment space, given job cutbacks. And, and so, so, so I was asked about REITs as a safety thing oh, about a month or two ago, before the carnage started. And what I said at the time was that's one of the last things to get sold because it's not until their incomes are impaired. So when people start getting laid off, retail sales go down. This happens so fast. And listen, folks, there's leveraged funds in real estate and REITs too. Some of these mortgage lending ETFs, the REIT mortgage lending, MORT, these things fell 70% in two or three days. 
there were some leveraged re ETFs. How about that? Yield on yield and yield, and it's great when it's going up. But the, there was a triple leveraged one, and in one day went down more than 30%. And guess what? Poof, the ETF disappeared. Three to one, down a third in one day, it's gone. Don't use the leverage ETFs, but it caused a lot of forced selling. The risk manager says, listen, we're wiped out. Sell everything. I don't care what the price is. We have to liquidate. It happened in the triple leverage gold ones, and it happened in the, all the, and the oil ones and so forth. And it, and it becomes baby with the bathwater. But when you see that and recognize it, the, you can take advantage of some of those extreme moves. But you got to be an institutional player, and you got to be wired in to take advantage of those things. REITs will come back. They're great investments, um, but there's going to be some impairment for a couple of quarters. Buy into the dips. I have no problem with them. Okay, Arnie, 54. I'm 54 too, Arnie. I removed my investments and put them into cash a year ago, a little early last year. You missed a big up year last year, uh, but we've now wiped out all those gains. So to me, this doesn't seem right with all the businesses um, laying off and economic downturns. Should I just wait it out or should I slowly reinvest? So, so always slowly reinvest. I can't tell you, Arnie, how much you should do. I know nothing about you, your financial circumstances. That's where a company like you, Potential, can come in where you can go and sit down with, with the smart people who, who do the financial planning, the experts, and understand what your roadmap looks like to retirement and beyond. And what that'll help you with, Arnie, is, is the understanding of how and when to invest. And it's not about market timing. It, it becomes about how do you invest so that your next 10, 20, 30, 40 years are taken care of, and you don't need to worry about volatility. So financial planning, folks, is such a core element of investing, and very few people really really talk about that a lot. And so we have this company um, where you don't have to invest with us, but you can, for a fee, get an expert, expert financial plan. And Monique Madden, who has appeared at some of our uh, Cross Canada BNN shows, uh, is, is exceptional. Um, she actually writes questions for the exams on the financial planning test. Uh, so she, she's quite quite impressive, and you'll really enjoy working with her. But should you wait? I, I don't know the answer to that, Arnie, but, but I, I've highlighted some of the levels where my shopping lists are coming out, and I'm confident that uh, I'm going to pick up bargains for the next five or ten years. So, uh, so uh, hopefully some of those play out. Let me see if I can grab some of these online questions here. Um, I think we got about 15 minutes left before... Um, we're, we're, we're times out on, on the seminar here. So uh, people ask me about NASDAQ, ZQQ hedge. Uh, I would say, you know, uh, that's, that's the NASDAQ. Should you buy it yet? No, mar market, guys, market. Okay. So it's, it's, it's you know, levels and, and you want to put money back. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's the ETFs I like or what the, the stocks, you, you, there's lower lows coming. Just, you, you just got to wait. Okay, and be patient because patience is, is going to be very beneficial uh, for here. Here's a question about um, Morno and wanted the power to tax, and that gets political. Listen, I, I'm mortified at the political climate and what politicians try to do in these environments. I tweeted something today, and incidentally, you want more timely comments, folks, please. Um, uh, the uh, you, you want to follow me on Twitter because I do tweet about markets and at Larry Berman ETF. But I tweeted something that I, I read some of the highlights of the bills. $150 billion was earmarked for help for uh, local and, and uh, state governments uh, that in a large case have, have mismanaged the fiscal purse, but, but really need some help. And in that bill, Nancy Pelosi put... $25 million stipend for one of her pet projects to expand the, the opera house in Washington, D.C. Now, to me, now I'm not a U.S. taxpayer, but I'm, like, I, I'm outraged by the political insensitivity and, and the disrespect for our hard-earned money. And while governments are essential in, in support in times like this, especially when they're, they're telling you you can't go to work, <laughs> Uh, and we all understand what, what this is about. But, but I, I, I'm, you're going to see a tremendous amount of political outrage 
the U.S. political season as we go into 2020 election is, is going to be mind blowing. And I've said for a while, Donald Trump won't come out of this alive. I believe that to be true. Um, I, I'm not, listen, I'm not a Democrat. I, I don't like, I don't think Joe Biden's the guy I didn't like Bernie Sanders. Um, I thought Pete Buttigieg might be interesting as a presidential candidate, but you know, political system is, is beyond corrupt um, and, and in Canada, everywhere in the world, and, and it really sickens me. Um, I, I like the, the uh, prime minister in New Zealand. Uh, you know, there was a mass shooting at a school and she banned assault weapons the next day. Like, why can't governments do that stuff? Right. So, so I don't like, I don't want to get too political, but there was a political question and, and I'm really uh, upset at the way governments have governed themselves in, in many ways. Listen, Trudeau shouldn't have been running a deficit for, for years here. Economy was reasonable to be good. He had no reason to spend more. He didn't, he just didn't. And so now when we need the money and help, he goes to the taxpayer and they, they do something like this. So it makes me mad, folks. But it doesn't matter what color the government is. Uh, they all are bad in that regard and, and they don't have enough respect for the taxpayer and frankly into the future. Um, anyways, I, enough of that. Let me, uh, let me see if there's any other questions here that, that come up. Uh, can I clarify if, if VIX or VXX and the difference between the two? It's, 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 I believe one's the playing the VIX and the other. Folks, don't try to trade volatility. The smartest people on the planet blow themselves up trading volatility. We, we had in early 2018 the VIX ETFs blow up. I, the, these things are like trying to uh, do um, cut and paste with C4, right? They're, they're so acute and finite of, of, of indicators. Even the experts have time, uh, have trouble with them. And I get that you want to try that, but, but I, I really, I, I don't recommend trading volatility. I, I really don't. Uh, what else do we have? There's a few long-term couch potatoes. You know, for couch potatoes out there, I, I talked about, um, you know, the, these, these just core globally diversified bond stock. The problem I have with all the ba very basic ETFs is that the whole asset class of fixed income is impaired. And, and it's, it's going to be impaired for, for decades. Bond yields aren't going to go up in a big way. Um, and, and, and so, so you have an asset class that yields nothing. It's, it's safe relatively than the governments because they're going to print money. They're not going to default governments. Uh, but but it's an asset class that, that is not going to provide you any growth at all. And, and yes, it's safe. But because of that, I think we need to get creative in fixed income. So so that's where credit markets come in and, and buying. But but credit has risk. And, and as we can see, as the balance sheets of corporations are bad, you, you don't want to go into a bond that's yielding six when the equivalent company beside it is yielding three. There's a reason it's yielding six. It's not yielding six because it's a better company. It's yielding six because it's a crappy balance sheet. And when things go bad, those are the companies that are going to need the bailout and the help. So, so what they're going to have to do in those situations to pay back the bondholders when that bond comes due is issue equity and dilute their stairs and hurt their earnings. And that's why companies with bad balance sheets should be avoided. So there's a, there's a class of ETFs that screen for companies with crappy balance sheets and throws them under the index. BMO has a series of ETFs called quality. And what that quality factor is, is in the MSCI world index and the US index and, and indexes is, is, is it says, well, if a company has a bad balance sheet, we don't want to own it. So let's get rid of all the companies and get rid of the half of them with the bad balance sheets. And now let's look at the good balance sheets and let's look at the free cash flow that they generate. And the companies that have good free cash flow, meaning they have good stable earnings, are going to be much solid, much more qualified dividend payers. And let's invest in those. So I had a chart on today's show where I showed the U.S. quality ETF, ZUQ, and, and a hedge version of that. Um, 
And, and the performance of those relative to the broad U.S. market, relative to the SPYB, the companies that have a lot of leverage because they've been buying back shares. And guess what? Guess which companies got hurt more in the downturn? So, so fixed income is a challenge, but there are still good companies, and you want to invest in the ones with the better balance sheets. So have a look at the BMO lineup and the quality factor. That's uh, very important. You can find that on the website Kevin Prince introduced at the top of the show on the BMO um, uh, website. So what else do we have in here? Bond Universe, I touched on bonds. Um, let's see, what else here? Um, personal line of credit, that, that one's not good. Can, uh, I talked about the currency a little bit. Um, AMLP, so that's U.S. pipelines. A few questions have come in on that. So, so this is an ETF that I like, uh, and my thesis on U.S. pipelines is is the the fracking industry is is going to be big for the next number of years. Um, and I didn't expect, and and I don't think many people expected that Russia and Saudi Arabia would somehow collude. I I don't know if they did or not behind closed doors, but it would appear that uh, they want to take a couple million barrels of U.S. shale production off the grid. And notwithstanding the shock to demand for oil, that happened right in the uh, midst of, of this whole COVID-19 starting to become acute and spread around the world a few weeks ago. And that compounded the problem in, in the energy sector. And I was... I was buy, I, I, I've been saying for years, oil, $10 plus or minus $50, 60, you're a seller of oil stocks, 40, you're a buyer. And I was adding to the, that exposure. I, I added to the XLE ETF in the U.S. when oil was getting into the lower 40s. And then lo and behold, that weekend, boom, rushes out. And the oil stocks open down 50%, oil prices fall 25%. 30% in one day, and, and now we're sitting at $20 oil, and, and it'll recover. And these stocks will recover appropriately. But the, the, the distribution on these are going to be cut, and they're going to be cut significantly. They're, the, the trailing distribution on these are probably showing up at, at, at 15 or 18%. You're not going to earn that going forward. These companies are going to have significant impairments. They're going to have to suspend their dividends. Um, but the companies are still viable. The pipelines still need to be there, and they'll be there for a long time into the future, and the sector will recover. But the distributions are going to be impaired. So if you're going to buy them, you're not going to be buying them for the distributions um, at the moment, folks. So just keep that in mind. I have not sold any AMLP. Uh, I have not added to my energy exposure. Uh, I had some short positions on crude oil, hedging some of my long energy positions, which I covered uh, the last tranche when oil, crude oil hit $20 sometime last week or the week before, I think. And, and so at that point, I, I'm happy owning crude oil and it'll recover over the next year or so. Um, but I'm doing that with option strategies and, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, got another five minutes or so before we're a wrap here. Uh, looking through the questions that have come in, uh, what else can we find here? There is a recording of the webinar. It'll it'll uh, it'll come uh, in the ETF uh, in the email. Sorry, that's coming following the webinar once we uh, go to post production, and you'll get it later tonight or sometime tomorrow. Uh, those of you who are saying thank you for for my help here tonight, well, you're very very welcome. Uh, the core of, of you know, I, I, I started doing uh, BNN. Uh, I was on uh, Market Call. The uh, first week of BNN was on TV back in 1999. I've been there from day three, folks. And I did, I, once a month, I, I did um, the, uh, the, the call um, on the Wednesday show. And I did it once a month, and I was a strategist at the time for CIBC World Markets. And and I talk about technicals and fundamentals and marrying market strategy together and, and how you the different asset classes and how everything works and ETFs were, were just starting to, to be very, very 
uh, growth oriented back then in terms of uh, more and more companies coming around with them. And I was talking about ETFs. And I guess people really liked what I said. And, and a couple of years after that, the head of BNN came to me and said, we would like to feature you on a regular basis on, on BNN. And instead of market call, we wanted to call it Berman's call. And and a couple of years went by and, and the bank didn't want to let me do that. And I kept going on market call. But but as Jared mentioned at the top of the call today, when I left BNN, when I left uh, the banking world to, to hang a shingle up and, and be an entrepreneur with ETF Capital Management with Jared uh, in 2006, I, I called Jack up. Fleischman up at the end and I said, Jack, I got no handcuffs anymore. I'm on my own. Uh, let's do a show. Let's focus on client education every week. I, I got to have five minutes at the end of the show where I can teach people how to do it better and, and what the tools are to navigate your own portfolios. And, and folks, thank you. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for, for, for tuning in every week and, and, and being great fans of the show. And I really hope you learn stuff. And, and thanks to all our sponsors. And please, folks, if you can spare 20 bucks or 50 bucks to help sick kids, there are a lot of great charities out there. Please, please, please help us out. We do these things for free. And, and I love investor education. And all we're asking is, is to be a little bit charitable. Dementia, Alzheimer's for the people. Their, their Baycrest Hospital in Toronto here has, has COVID in it. And, and they're trying to contain it. So, so folks, any help you can, can give to either one of these charities be greatly, greatly appreciated. We're going to wrap it here, folks. We're going to be doing these things once a week. All the details um, of the presentation, I'm going to try to answer as many of your questions over the coming weeks as possible, both live on BNN and here on the webinar version of our roadshows. Uh, for as long as it takes to get us through this, but certainly through to the end of April. Thanks very much, folks. Uh, good luck, and uh, and um, uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah.